Welcome to Let's Chat, the show where we talk to other business brokers, CPAs, attorneys, anybody that we can talk to so that we can improve as business brokers. My name is Jim Parker. I'm really excited today because we have with us Neil Isaacs. Neil is a friend of mine. He is a former president of the Carolina Virginia Business Brokers Association. We serve together on the International Business Brokers Association board. He has done a lot for the IBBA over the years, done a lot for the industry over the years. And today we're going to pick Neil's brain on how we can become better business brokers. How are you doing today, Neil? I am doing great, Jim. Thank you for having me. I'm a big fan of the show. I am uber excited about our conversation today. Fantastic. Well, I'm really glad to have you on. And before we begin, uh, you have a fantastic show yourself. How can people find you on YouTube, Neil? Because I love your show. I really do. Oh, thank you. Thanks. So Raleigh Business Broker is, is my handle on YouTube. I, my YouTube is a lot of business broker education, but we do a lot of the similar stuff to you as far as educating business owners, business buyers, business advisors. So passionate about all things business brokerage. I put that on Raleigh Business Broker on YouTube. Okay, great, great. And if you guys are listening go, and you haven't watched Neil's show, head over there and watch it. He's got some great information on there. So, Neil, you got to tell me. I want to I get some insight today with you. Um, and be, before we begin again, I just want to mention one thing. I, if, if, if you're watching this right now, if you wait long enough, you are going to find out what M&Ms and business brokerage have to do with each other. <laughs> and Neil, I, I, you know, I know you know what I'm talking about. I do. And I love right, M&Ms. So, <laughs> what are the things that you think of? And we had a, convers we had a great conversation the other day, and, and, and it was really great, Neil. It's always great talking to you. But, you know, what are the things that you really think about when you're thinking about being, you know, business brokerage? What are the things that I think about with business brokerage? Yeah. You know, you said you really give a lot of thought to a couple of things and I want to yeah. touch on those things. I, you know, when I think about business brokerage being an intermediary, I think about um, how this is a super important role that we serve for our business owners. And I think about how it's, it's kind of a marketing business. If you really distill it down, it's, it's all about being in the right place at the right time. And, and I think about how if you don't, care about clients and customers, you're never going to survive long term. So kind of the, the reason why business brokers are successful, I think those those are important. Yeah, yeah. And I know when we were talking the other day, Neil, it was really it was really nice because and this is the kind of person you are, you know, a lot of times we get really involved in talking about systems and procedures and, you know, doing this and doing that. And what I really enjoyed about our conversation the other day is that you were really talking about service you know, the service Absolutely. you feel for that you, 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 you need to give to your seller and buyer if you wanted to elaborate on that, because I think that was a really great conversation we had about that. Yeah. So it kind of goes back to my origin story. We all have our, our origin stories, how we got to where we're at today. And mine was mm -hmm. kind of unconventional being a, a, a shark diver at a public aquarium and ultimately owning a small business selling basically Nemo and Dory and finding myself in that situation that a lot of our clients are, which is just Hey, I, I'm doing this now. I want to do something else. This, this has served me well, but I'm ready for something else. And just not really knowing how to, to get from that one leap pad to the, to the next, um, that one lily pad to the next. And me being in that situation and kind of reaching out and meeting some people to help me, I just understand every time I talk to somebody, I kind of put myself in, in their shoes, I'm on their side of the desk, and I know exactly what they're feeling, how important that transaction is. So I, I bring that to every every deal I have, every opportunity I have to talk with a business owner. Just this is a the most important asset that they have. They most of them, as you know, are first time sellers, and they the the role that we serve as intermediaries is just so important. We got to get it right, or else the consequences are just dire. So that's something I think about a lot. And, and, and service as an intermediary. Yeah, it sounds like you really you really concentrate on on how well you service your seller and your buyer, and you really put yourself in their shoes and what their needs and their wants are. And I think you know, as, as business brokers, you know, you know, we do this day in and day out for years upon years. And you know, I, I know it's always in my forefront of my mind as well. But we can never forget that, can we, Neil? This is, like you said, the biggest asset of their life. They've never been through this process before. It, it can yeah. be scary for them. 
you know, they don't know how the, the process goes. And, you know, there's, there's so much knowledge that we, we have as business brokers on, on, you know, getting them from point A to point Z. And, um, yeah. you know, we got to make sure we get that, you know, we explain that to them thoroughly and not just, you know, expect them to, you know, know everything that we really have to take the time out to really have these deep conversations with them. Yeah. And I really respect yeah. and, the fact, Neil, that you like when we were talking the other day, I really respect the way you approach that. That was a big thing for you is, is, is how much you really mean that, you know, to really service your sellers and buyers. Well, I, I appreciate that. And another thing we talked about is kind of the, the connotations that business brokers have, the preconceptions that business owners may have about business brokers. So I'm thinking about like I'm going into this and we're going to have this conversation and I know that you have to go from A to Z, and there's a lot we have to accomplish together. And I know that their mindset may be, uh, who is this dirty business broker? I've, I've heard that these business brokers are just in it for the money. So I'm, I'm trying to meet them and, and explain what we do and why it's so important. And, and to your point, it takes a lot of conversations. It takes getting to know people and what their ultimate goals are. Mm -hmm. um, I'm famous for this question I ask, what does success look like to you? You know, I always, we can talk about the money, we can talk about whatever, but ultimately you, we're here today talking about the sale of your business. If you look back one year, three year, five years from now and say, I'm really glad I met Neil because I accomplished this. What exactly would that be? Right. I ask that question to every single owner in that first conversation, um, just to kind of get it like, what are we doing here? What, why is this important? Sometimes I'll tell you, but sometimes you have to um, scr scratch it a little bit farther to get to that, the true why. Right, right, right. You know, like, because a business owner gets on the phone and you start talking to them and, you know, why are you selling? And they're saying, oh, I want to retire. I want to this or whatever. But, you know, I, I think you have to, I think we as business intermediaries need to dig a little bit deeper in those conversations too, you know, yeah. like what's important to you out of this sale? You know, yeah. what, what, what's the perfect buyer for you? You know, maybe we're not able to find that perfect buyer, but you know, who is that? You know, what, if you had to come up with a stereotype of what that perfect buyer would be, what is it? Yeah. You know, what are you going to do post, you know, post sale? You know, what do you want out of this? You know, not to, and, and that, I think knowing that information, we get to know the sellers better and that we can serve them better. Yeah. And we get to know if we want to work with them. Sometimes we'll meet with an owner and think, well, I could probably do this deal, but I don't know if, if this is going to be a great experience for both of us. Like, let's make sure there's a fit here. If I'm going to serve you, Mr. and Mrs. Business Owner, we're going to work together for six to nine months, maybe a year. Am I the best person to serve you? If I'm not, then I don't, I don't want to set those expectations that I'm going to get, get in this boat and, and paddle out to sea with you if, if it's not the best fit. Yeah. I mean, the relationship that a, a business broker has with the seller, I think is extremely important. Like you said, we're working with them for a long period of time. And, you know, there's going to be a, a lot of times that we're going to have to you know, fight through issues together and, you know, we're going to be in the trenches together yeah. um, at, at times. And, and that relationship is really, really critical. I and mean, we're going to have a lot of conversations over the time. And the last thing I want, I always say this, I, I, last thing I want to do is every time I have to talk to the seller, I pick up the phone and I'm like, oh, yeah. I don't want to call them. And I don't want them yeah. to feel like that to me. Like, oh, I don't want to call Jim. I don't want to talk to him. Yeah. You know, digging a little deeper on that, I know you have a lot of new intermediaries watching this. And I got to say, like that relationship with the seller, when you think about it, they, they can't tell their employees that they're selling. Mm -hmm. They don't want to spook them and their wife or, or their husband. They're, they're kind of sick about hearing it, too. That's who they normally confide in. But a lot of times you, the intermediary, you know their business and they feel comfortable confiding in you. So you will have these conversations about the business. But that relationship goes deep deep. If you're doing it right, you're having a lot of conversations. You know them very, very well, and they will confide in you. And you want to make sure that that is a person that you like to work with, because it, it's going to be a relationship unlike any other that you've had. You, we're, it you know, is like any other, family. isn't it? It really it is. is that relationship. Well, let me ask you, Neil, you know, like you do, post closing, do you do you do you have um, you have a lot of friends with your friends with a lot of your past sellers? Absolutely. Yeah, we, we always take them to lunch or dinner. And my thing there is we don't even have to talk about your deal. Like we just got through talking about your deal for the last several months. Let's just mm -hmm. talk about, you know, what you're excited about moving forward. Let's talk about all the stuff we never had a chance to talk about 
when we were having our business meetings. And right. I check in with them. I put them on my calendar to check in once a year and just hear what what they're up to. I like to hear what, what kind of I mentioned, you know, they're going from this lily pad to this lily pad. I've learned, Jim, and, and you, you could probably sympathize with this. You don't check in with them like the first two weeks or month in. You got to give them three months, six months until you really see where they've landed. They're, they're so in their head after the sale. You don't really get to see who the post business owner is until several months later. Yeah. But I love hearing the, kind of the rest of the story. Yeah, I always, I do the same thing. I, I I keep in touch with my my past sellers, and, and it, it's one of my favorite parts of 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 my job is reaching out to them and say say you know a year later and like how, how are things going and what's going on and da 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 da. And it's yeah. nice because I feel like they're generally happy to hear from me. I'm generally happy to hear from them and what they're what they're doing right now. And it is a really cool relationship you end up building. It's cool to check in after the sale because you've done your job. You, you know, they're the, up till you, the closing, it's like, Neil, you can accomplish this, but it's like, I already did my job. So there's no pressure that I have to give you a campaign update or explain why this buyer flaked out. It's just, I'm just checking in with you. And I want to really, I'm showing that I really do care about you as a person. So I love those people always take the time to have those conversations and they're very relaxing. Yeah. I'm going to pick your brain in a minute about what you think makes a successful business broker. But first I yeah. want you to kind of give us the quick journey of how you became a business broker. Yeah. So again, I think probably the most untraditional path to business brokerage. Um, you do have one up. of the most unusual paths to becoming yes. a business broker. I got to say that. Go ahead. Absolutely. I'm sorry. Uh, grew up na nature boy, Neil, um, working at local, you know, pet stores, I had a mentor very early on who built this kind of pet store and he just kind of lived in this, world unlike any others that he created of his own. So business owner, naturalist type of thing. And I, I really emulated that. I like that. And then got I was went down this biology road. I got I'm a biological sciences major and um Clemson University. My first job out of college was at Ripley's Aquarium of the Smokies. I was a shark diver. So I was the guy that would uh keep the sharks off the folks that were cleaning the tunnel. And that was that was a fun after college job. And you were swimming, um, you were actually swimming with the sharks. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you go to these public aquariums, they have kind of a people mover yeah. and you can look up at the sharks, but they have to clean the acrylic that the, the, the try to settles on the uh, acrylic. That's, you know, that people are going through the uh, same type of tunnel system you see at the airport, but they move the people along, they have an acrylic dome and people clean that. And then other people keep the sharks from bothering the people that are cleaning that. So that was my shark diving job. It was a fun after college job. I did it for a while. And then I found a pet store for sale in Raleigh, North Carolina on biz by sell. And I told my shark diving boss, this has been great. I'm going to open a pet store. And um, he's like, okay, dude, this is a dream job. I got a million people that want to do this right behind you. Um, he did put up a little bit of a fight, but I, I moved here. I'm in, I'm in Raleigh. 21 years ago and um, ran my tropical fish store. Basically I sold Nemo and Dory for about five years and I, I, it was a successful store. You know, it was my first time managing employees and I was young. I was 25 when I started, I sold it when I was 30, but I was definitely learned a lot about small business ownership. And that's this, that's where I, I can kind of see the stresses of business ownership. I mean, every decision you make is so it's so imperative to your business. And um, it was, I found myself burnt out, just ready for a new chapter. And I was that, that client that I serve now. And, and that's when I first met a business intermediary, did not know they existed till I needed one and eventually got through that journey. And um, I didn't become a business broker immediately. I, I had a corporate job for a little bit, actually in advertising. And um, I use some of that today in business brokerage, but um before I, when I was getting closer to 40, I'm like, you know what? I really enjoyed being a business owner. Let's, let's go down this path of what would it be like to become an intermediary? And I interviewed probably 40 different brokers. I went to a bunch of programs like the CVBBA. One reason I'm so passionate about them. I went to a, a weekend conference at a CVBBA. And that was kind of my litmus test. Does, is that a good idea to hang out with these deal guys? And it turned out, you know, I came back excited from that. 
just kept testing myself until I'm like, yeah, I think I'm going to do this. And uh, I told my boss, uh, media sales boss, turns out I was born to be a business broker. I'm going to go do that now. I'll give you two weeks notice. And he's like, yeah, we don't need two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I started that day. That was back end of 2016. Mm, great. You know, Neil, you, you, that I, I had, a, I owned my own business for, for about 10 years too. Um, in my early years, um, I was about 24 when, when I became a business owner as well. And I feel like that being that small business owner really helps me as being a business broker. And I think Absolutely. some of the best business brokers out there have that small business background. Small, you know, they've owned small businesses before. Do you feel like that that's really helped you as well? Absolutely. And, and most of the, when we, when we look at intermediaries to join our team, we always ask that question. Like, do you have experience? Have, just because it's one thing to look at a P and L, but it's another thing to be responsible for the P and L to understand every decision you make in a small business affects it's, it's monumental. Um, right. I mean, I'm glad I had that short stint working for, uh, uh the advertising agency because it was a giant corporation. It became spectrum media. But I remember there were times where I felt like, you know, I could just take a week off and nobody would notice. I'm just one little tiny cog in this giant wheel. Like it's not that significant, one little employee. But when you own a small business, you are every cog in the wheel. Right. And it feels like you can make a difference in the weekend by, by Monday, you can make a decision and see the effects on the weekend. So it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of opportunity too, but just to have those, just to know what that feels like. I think if you've been a small business owner, you understand the importance of it. So what do you, what do you think makes a, a successful business broker? So I, I, I alluded to this a little bit when I quit my job as an advertising guy, I, w I went full time. I'm like, I'm not going to dabble in this. I'm going to put all my eggs in this basket. This will be it for me. And I have gone back and forth about whether you can do part time. And a lot of people ask me, can I just kind of ease into this? And I used to say, yeah, it's going to take longer. But now I think the chances of, of being successful by starting to dabble, I think they're pretty low. I think going full time is a part of the reason why I, I've been successful. Um, burn the boats is another, ex another expression you hear. So going full-time is really important in business brokerage. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Neil. I mean, I, you know, I, I see people try to get into this industry and try to do it part-time and, and, and you can't do it. Now, I think that if you were a business intermediary and, and, and you did it for 20, 30 years and you want to yeah. semi-retire and you want to do it part-time, I think you can absolutely do it at that point, you know, because yeah. you've got the experience and, and, you know, you got the knowledge, you've got a, a you know, a book of, of repeat clients and customers and things like that. But to start out in this industry, working part time, I, I don't I've never seen it work. And I don't know that it's fair for your clients either, because buyers right. don't care if you're part time. They, they want answers immediately. And back to service, to serve your clients, it's a full time gig. So going full time, I think, is is critical. And, that, and again, I've, my thoughts have evolved on that. I, I didn't, I went full time, but I've, I've had people work in my office and, 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 you know, working other jobs and stuff like that. And, um, I really do think the success rate and the service to your clients is just totally different if you're a full-time intermediary, which is hard right. to do. You know, the, the stats for new business brokers are not great. No, a lot of them don't make money in their first year. So yeah, that's you know, a challenge. I, I, I know this business broker, I'm going to talk in very general terms, but there, there's this business broker that worked as a, as a lender for many, many years. And, um, he quit to become a business intermediary. Yeah. And I, 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 about six months afterwards, um, I, I, I ran into him and I'm like, Hey, how's, how's it going? Become, you know, being a business broker. And he's like, Jim, it's bad. It's bad. Yeah. I'm not making any money. Ran into him about a year later. I'm like, Hey, how's it going? He goes, Jim, it's horrible. My wife's telling me I should go back to being a lender. Da, 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 yeah. da, da. I'm like, yeah, wow, just hang in there. Year three, he was crushing it, Neil. Crushing yeah. it. He yeah. was a top producer. I mean, he he was killing it year three. But it, it's a lot of gear up time. You know, it really is. Snowball effect for sure. And and um, 
Yeah, it's like any business. You know, you can't expect immediate results, and you, it takes time. It takes time. Yeah, so going full time is critical, especially in our yeah. industry, because it takes a long time to you know to put your name out there where you get a listing, and then you finally get a listing, and it takes you know it takes a long time to sell that listing, and you know then you, you 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 try to do that multiple times. It's 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 a tough industry to break into, yeah. you know, in a short period of time. So. What other, what other things make up a successful business broker, do you think? So that we talked about the commitment. The other piece of it is like, why are you doing it? Because I, a lot of people see the money and they kind of chase that. But if you don't have a compelling story beyond the money, like if you're not passionate about serving people, it's, it's going to kind of become obvious. I mean, we're, it's a competitive market. I'm in for business brokers. We're pitching against other intermediaries. And they want to kind of understand not only that you're qualified, but you, that you really do care. Some of that stuff we were talking about earlier about connecting with the business owner and understanding their journey and understanding how important it is. Like you can't just do it for the money. There's got to be a driving force that is, is compelling you to, to put yourself in this situation of representing a seller. It's a huge responsibility. And if you're just in it for the money, it's going to become obvious. It's not going to work out the way that you're yeah. hoping for. And so I think that's that, really important. You know, when you say that, I think I read somewhere at one point that the, like the average business broker makes fifty or sixty thousand dollars a year. You know, obviously there's brokers that do a lot better than that. I'm just saying, yeah. you know, you, you average in. You, um, well, these are averages, you know. Yeah. But um, you know, they, they, I guess people from the outside think, oh my gosh, every every business broker is making a ton of money, and there are brokers yeah. making doing a really good job. But you know, it, it's it's. The average is yeah, a lot of them are struggling. And to your point that, you know, if you want money quick and you're just doing it for the money, it's probably not going to work out for you, especially if you're skilled, you have skills to make money in another way. Um, you know, follow your passion is super important. And I, I'm fortunate that I'm super passionate about things that line up with entrepreneurship. And so it's, it's a great fit for me for that reason. I think that comes through when I'm talking to clients. They, they, they understand that I've been there. I've done that. I understand their journey. I'm trying to connect with them. So I think that the, the drive factor is really important. And the other big factor I mentioned, you know, I came from a marketing background. I think that the marketing piece is a lot bigger than people realize. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know about you, but I, I think this is not just a business of serving others, but I think this is a marketing career. It is. It really is because we're in marketing, not we're marketing ourselves, you know, to, to get the listings. Then, you know, we're marketing the listings that we have for sale and we're trying to sell yeah. something that's, you know, obviously we're trying to sell it confidentially. So we're, yeah. we're trying to sell something without anybody knowing what we're trying to sell. You know, it is. It's a lot of it's a lot of marketing. Now, I want to touch base on that marketing because I want to go more in detail about the marketing with you because most yeah. business brokers out there that are new or have been doing it for a few years. That's the question they ask the most is, you know, how do you market yeah. for listings and things like that? And I want us to touch on that in a minute, but um, yeah. you know, I, I want to tell you, I feel the same way about the passion. I think the passion's huge in this industry. You have to have the passion. Yeah. You know, I love, I love small business. Uh, you know, I, I, I love our industry and, and I love small business. And I also love that, I love the mentality of, of business owners. You know, I love yeah. that mentality of somebody that, you know, started with nothing and went yeah. out there and they worked their butt off. It took them several years before they were able to, able to hire their first employee. They kept at it. And then you fast forward 20, 25 years down the road. And, you know, now they've got 10, 15 trucks on the road or, you know, whatever company they kind of yeah. own. And, you know, they put the sweat and tears into it and, you know, maybe they worked 80, 100 hours a week in the early years. And, you know, now they're, they're starting, you know, now they for many years, they've seen the rewards of all that sweat equity that they put into the company. And I don't know. I just I just love that because like, at the end of the day, that's like the American dream is owning your own business. And I love that. And on the flip side of that, on the flip side, I love working with those buyers that that. You know, they, they, they're college educated. They, they went out and they worked in the corporate world for like 25, 30 years. They've done really well for themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, they're making a decent salary. They got a good net worth and they're in their forties and fifties and they're, they're looking around and going, you know, even though they've done really well for themselves, they're looking around and going, I've always wanted to own my own business. And, you know, mm -hmm. if I don't do it, when am I going to do it? You know, this might be my last shot and they want to acquire a business and, 
you know, seeing the excitement that they have to become, a, you know, to buy a business, to acquire that business and touching base with them, you know, a year later, three years later and seeing what they're able to do from, you know, taking that that business from, you know, X amount of sales and, and pushing it up. And I mean, I just love everything about our industry. You know, it's, know. it's fantastic. It's just good people all the way around, I feel like. What you're describing, it's like it's we're riding shotgun on these deals with with these people that are just uber accomplished business people like they they're extremely successful in their specific niche. They're really good. I could never be a, a master plumber and build a, you know, a six or seven figure plumbing business. Yeah. But some of my clients have, but they do need help with this. And I get to go along with them, kind of see how they process information, what's important to them and be the matchmaker and then find the buyer that you're talking about that's accomplished all this other stuff and to put them together and to be the shepherd along that journey, you kind of see them, how they, they come together. And then at a certain point you leave and they keep going on their journey and you get to check in on them. Um, it, it's a lot of fun. And there's another element that I like that is kind of interesting to me is these people are hiring really smart people for their advisors, their attorneys, their accounts or CPAs, they're they're bankrolling that and you're learning from them too which yeah. is really fun to to get that that knowledge yeah absolutely that's great well let's talk about marketing cuz you know that that's the question that like i said a lot of new brokers or intermediate you know, inter, you know intermediate brokers they're always asking how do you market for listings da da da, da. so yeah. how what's your thought process on that well I'll, I'll tell you the easy button right now this is all you have to do to have all the listings you want for the rest of your life no, I'm just kidding. You, you can put that in the pool. <laughs> there is nothing. There's yeah, nothing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Everybody leaned in right there, right? Uh, the the answer is unfortunately it's the boring stuff. It's it's doing it's going back to the basics. You know, Vince Lombardi said like this is a football. You know, let's go back to the basics and talk about who is your audience, and and what is the reach and the frequency of getting your message in front of the audience. So I think about that. That a lot. I hearken back to my advertising days when we were we were putting together TV commercial packages and saying, well, you know, if, if we want to reach homeowners, then we want to have this particular message and we want to put it in this particular area of, of the triangle market on these different, maybe on HGTV and not on, you know, this Comedy Central or whatever. There's there's different there's different audience strategies there. So for me, particularly as a business intermediary, we do a little bit of everything, whether it's pay-per-click, social media. I, I'm, I'm a networker. I go and meet with centers of influences where, where they're going. But part of my strategy, I just call it the, the top of the funnel or the top of the feed strategy is I'm always inventing ways to get in front of people, to get to the top of their feed, whether it's their inbox, their social media, their texts. Um, I am creating ways to do that on a, on a regular basis in different mm. different channels. I'm thinking about yeah. that with every move that I make. Yeah, you know, and I, I feel like, you know, I, business brokers are looking, some business brokers are looking for like a magic bullet, you know, that there's that one thing that they're gonna do and all these business owners and be like, yeah, I wanna, I wanna sell my business with you. And there is not a magic bullet. There's no secret, this is what you need to do. I mean, I know, you know, there's a lot of different marketing and advertising you can do, you know, brokers do drop offs where they take a letter yeah. and, you know, they write, Hey, if you want to sell your business, give me a call. They put an envelope, write confidential. And they go around at five o'clock in the morning, they drop it off at a bunch of retail stores, you know, tape it to the, to the, to the doors. And, you know, people do cold calling, people send out mailers, people are doing social media. Some people are, you know, like you said, pay per click. I'm like any, you know, it's like any business out there, there's, tons and tons of different ways of marketing and advertising. Yeah. And, you know, everything, you know, th those are all your choices. You know, the thing is, you just got to do pick a couple things and you got to do them consistently and you got to do them often and you're going to get that that work, you know? Yeah. And, and the, the challenge com coming from a marketing background my initial impressions on marketing were like, I got this. I'm not going to make all these mistakes that the, mm -hmm. the gin pop makes. And I've made all of the mistakes. I've fallen for all the, the stuff that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, 
a lot of marketers are really good at selling themselves, but they're not that great at executing on what they say they're going to sell. And that's an unfortunate truth. Mm -hmm. So how do you pick the right one? I think that uh, the one thing is you've got to give everything a minimum of 90 days, like three months. If you're not seeing some tangible results, assuming it's not a branding campaign, if it's pay-per-click, if it's social media, if it's something that you're supposed to get results that you can measure, you know, if you, if you try it for one month, it's probably not enough. If you try it for three months, it's probably not going to change a whole lot after that. It, again, unless it's like just general branding campaign. So sticking, picking the right horse and sticking with it for long enough is part of the challenge. And picking a, a few different avenues, you know? Yeah. And, and what I, what I used to do too, is I used to, you know, pick like the, 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 what I want, the, the, the people I wanted to hit and yeah. I would hit them over and over again by different, different ways. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, send them an email, send them a, 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 you know, a snail mail, you know, um, you know, do this, do that. And, and, you know, and then I would meet with them and I'd be like, Hey, how'd you hear about, how'd you hear about me? And they'd be like, Oh, well, I hear about you. I, I've just seen you everywhere. And I'm like, I'm thinking yes. to myself, I'm not everywhere. I'm doing like three or four things. I'm just keep targeting you three or four different ways, you know, and I'm targeting that same list over and over and over again, different ways. It, it, you know, that you hit, I was going to say the exact same thing. You want them to say, I see you everywhere. And what they mean is, you were in my inbox. I heard you on the radio. And then I was on, you were on my social. I saw a video you made on social. It's one thing to hit them over and over again on one channel, but if you can hit them on multiple channels, the, the omni screen effect, it's going to cut through in a different way. And they're you're going to seem bigger and they're going to remember you when they have, when they need your services. Most, most business owners don't need our services until a very, very small amount of time. And that's when we have to, they have to think of us and know how to reach us. Yeah. And I know you and I, we, we do a lot of, um, you know, social media and we do yeah. a lot of, you know, videos and things like that. Um, you know, for me, I feel like, I guess that's what I feel comfortable doing and that I've picked, but you know, I, I think the person needs to, the business broker needs to pick what they feel comfortable doing, what works for their personality. You know, I've seen people do really well advertising in those little, um, local, neighborhood magazines, you know yeah. what I mean? For the county or whatever. And they yeah. kill it, you know, through that. I mean, you just got to pick your, your, what you feel the best doing and what matches your budget and, you know, go play to your strengths, play mm -hmm. to your strengths. You Jim are great on camera and people feel that you are earnest and they can connect with you through video. And, and I try and emulate that. No, I don't you. you emulate you. You are, you're Neil. I was, I, I feel that way about you. You're fantastic well, on your videos. Well, I, I appreciate that. And I did do, I took Toastmasters for a short period of time years ago, and that was intentional. Like I want to get better at speaking and connecting with people and, and communicating with people, but not everybody feels comfortable doing that. Some people are great with technical skills. They can, they can do their own pay-per-click campaign and use just the right keywords. They're really good at direct mail and picking the right list. Lean into whatever you're really good at and outsource yeah, maybe the stuff great, that you can. You're a great writer, you know, so write a lot of blogs, you know, or maybe you're yeah. great at SEOing and you concentrate on SEOing. It's just, yeah. yeah, you're right. Yeah. Lean into the stuff that you're good at and the stuff that you're not good at. Either don't do it or hire someone else to do it. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, while we're talking about it, you know, I do YouTube videos, obviously you do YouTube videos. And by the way, Neil, where can they find you to watch your show? The Raleigh Business Broker, or the YouTube channel. All right, great. So we yeah. both do YouTube videos. In one video that I released last week, I had a comment that was left from me. It wasn't left by a broker. Um, it was left by, I don't know who it was left by. It was left by a guy um named arena rat and he wrote brokers are nothing but pos and i think everybody knows what pos means get ready you're not gonna like it and <laughs> you know i responded to that comment i was like you know hey and I, I forget how i worded it but it was basically hey you know i'm sorry it sounds like you've worked with some really bad business brokers in the past you know we're not all like that i would love to have a conversation with you not a conf not confrontational 
but you know, I'd really like to have an honest conversation with you and, and, and find out what your, you know, what had happened. And I, and I left my cell, my cell phone number in that, in that comment section. I, I, he didn't reply to that and he hasn't called me, but you know, I recently saw that you did a video because there's videos out there. There's people doing YouTube videos saying that, you know, brokers are horrible or you shouldn't use a broker. And I want to touch on that. You know, I sure let's touch on that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. The, the dirty business broker, right? There's that's a connotation that, that you'll hear from people like arena rad and others that undoubtedly they had a bad experience with an intermediary and or a few, maybe even a few, maybe a few, maybe they just haven't met the right intermediary. Maybe they don't, they're not the type of person that likes to leverage professional services. Maybe they want to do it themselves. I don't, I don't know how they, I don't know who hurt you. Like, I don't know why you would have such strong feelings about a, a, a profession like that. But I mean, you know, if I need something done for legal purposes, I don't do it myself. I hire a lawyer. You know, I, I view us just like any other professional advisor that's got to execute on a specific task. I want to work with somebody who's dedicated their career to educating themselves and being the best that they can at that. So that's, that's where I think I'm, I'm trying to raise the bar for business brokers. I am aware that there are some business intermediaries, maybe they're not intermediaries, but they, they want to do a deal um, because they see the money there. Maybe they, maybe they do other types of deals and they think, well, if I could do that, then I could just sell this business too. And, and there is, I recognize there is a lot of that. And so I'm trying to shine a light on that. I think there, there, there are great business intermediaries out there that leverage great education. You know, I'm a huge fan of the IBBA and everything that, that they're doing for the business brokerage community. So that's, that's where I'm focused. And I'm, I'm quick to say, hey, don't trust the dirty business broker because I know people are thinking that and I wanna shine a light on that and say, why, why do you feel that way? Why am I different? Or why, why should you seek out the services of, of, of a professional with designations that's put all this time into it? I want people to know that there are great business brokers out there in the service yeah, that we offer. There really is. There's, you know, it's like any industry, you know, you got great people, you've got good people and you've got really bad people, yeah. you know, and, and maybe some of these people just came across a few really bad intermediaries, but you know, you find the right, inter it makes a huge difference, you know, not just for the seller, because I think it's usually coming from buyers, not the sellers. Yeah. The sellers I think are more likely to see the value in the business broker themselves when they're working with a, with a good one, obviously, you know, yeah. cause then again, there's, there's, there's bad business brokers out there, unfortunately, but when they're working with a good business broker, they can see that maybe the buyers are not, are not seeing that as much as the seller. Um, but you know, I, I don't know. It, 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 it might just be that they're getting a few bad business brokers or, you know, I think sometimes they, are get frustrated because we're trying to pre-screen them and try trying to pre-qualify them and we're making sure that they have the financial capability to buy the business they have the experience to buy the business that they're truly motivated to buy the business and we're not willing to disclose information about the name of the business or anything about the business until they've signed a confidentiality agreement we pre-screen them and they get yeah. upset that we're not just handing that kind of information over to them and you know, I'm so glad you went there, Jim, because it, it, it kind of underscores a, a, one of the role. We talked about how important our role is the protective role that we as intermediaries have for our business sellers. This is how it's reflected. Mr. Business buyer, I understand you want you want to see the full book. You want to, you know, you want to go and meet with the owner tomorrow. You just found out this business is for sale today. But we got some stuff to get through. Let's sign an yeah. NDA. Let's get you on the phone. Let's make sure you have the money. What's your path to purchase? People get upset sometimes because we make them g jump through these hoops, but we're trying to protect our client because everybody wants to, to meet with them tomorrow and they don't have the time for that. And they hired us to screen out these buyers. So you do see some, I would say that buyers sometimes get frustrated with that process, but there's a reason for it. And we're, we're trying to not just protect the seller's time, which is very valuable because they're trying to run a, run a business. That's a very valid point, but it's also... You know, we're trying to predict that the business is for sale because, you know, if, if everybody knows the business is for sale, it could hurt the business. You know, yeah. you know, we can't employees can't know customers can't know 
vendors and suppliers, competition. I mean, all that, and I don't want to go down reason why on this video, yeah. all those reasons, because most of the people are listening are business brokers and they understand that, but yeah. you know, it could affect the business, you know, itself. And we got to protect that. We're trying, you know, we've got to protect that as you know, if you look at a listing and it has a hundred interests, a hundred people raise their hand, probably 50% or more have no business inquiring about that business. They're just curious or they're trying to learn what, what's there. I think and you're being optimistic. Our, yeah, it's probably more than that. <laughs> but that's a big part of our roles to filter through, find the one, the, the cream that rises to the top. And it's sometimes, you know, you upset some people doing that, but it just doesn't make sense. We want to help them get focused on the right opportunities. And this, we know this one isn't the right one for them. You know, I, I saw it, an, another uh, clip the other day and it was a gentleman saying, Hey, you know, they got the baby boomer generation, you know, that's retiring and they're going to be selling their businesses or they're going to be exiting their businesses, blah, blah, blah. And they said he was selling himself and saying, yeah, you can get into a business with 0% down, take my class. It's only yeah. $10,000, but you know, you could get a business, you could walk in with 0% down and you could be making a quarter of a million dollars or more a year, blah, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And, and my heart just sunk, Neil. I'm like, I wonder how many people are being sucked into this. And I've seen, and he's not the only one. I've seen other things where 0% down, let me, you know, take my course, take my class. Look, you know, one, there was a, a rule last year with the SBA in August of last year. They said that, you know, you can get a business with an SBA loan with 0% down, but mm -hmm. lenders are not good. At, I have yet to meet a lender that said we're willing to do a 0% down situation. And yeah. if they're willing to do something like a 5% down, it's usually like if the person is an employee of the business that's been there for a long term. I mean, like, but still 10% down is good. You can go, come yes. in and get a, an SBA loan for 10% down, but they're trying all these different things. Like one video I saw, it was like, this guy was like, yeah, you, you go to the supplier, you get the owner to carry a note, you go to the supplier and you say, well, you know, if this business isn't there, you're, you're going to lose their business. So, you know, you kick in some money and, you know, they're, they're, they're pulling all this stuff out. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I've been doing this for nearly 25 years, Neil. You've been doing it a long time. Yeah. Me and you, we probably each know hundreds of business brokers. This is what we do for a living. And yeah. we all know that this information they're putting out there is complete BS, but they're just selling these classes. And it yeah. makes me upset. Well, I, I have the same thing. And that's getting worse. And, and it's back to YouTube. That gets a lot of clicks. Think about yeah. the person sitting in a cubicle that wants to be a business owner. And they, they see on their lunch break that they can get a passive income. And some business owner is going to basically give them their business. And they have no money down. Like, who wouldn't do that? They're going to escape maybe a life they don't like, and they're going to get into this, this sexy thing of being an entrepreneur and it's not going to cost them anything. Like sign me up for that. Right. But that, yeah, I think that's no. I wouldn't be I a business we, broker. I'd just be buying businesses every other day. You know, we get these calls all the time and yeah, I'm looking for passive income and sell no money down. And, and um, you know, I understand the, the owner has to have a license. I, I hope they have someone else that can kind of have that license in my place. Cause I'm in California. I'm not going to move. It's like, well, don't you think I would buy it if it was that easy? Like we wouldn't even bring it to market. If, if it's literally no, no time investment and pure return, it doesn't exist. But yeah. people look for that all the time and people produce content that say it's out there and you're going to find it. And it's easy. We're up against yeah. that. You know that when rich dad, poor dad, I thought it was a really good book, but when that came out, you know, my, my phone would just seem like it was for like a year or two. It was just people calling yeah. up and saying, yeah, I don't want to quit my full-time job, but I want to buy a, you know, business as, you know, passive income. I'm like, you know, I, what you need to do is take that money and, and, and buy some mutual funds is what you should yeah. do, you know? Absolutely. Um, it, you know, and not I'm not there. saying that there's not businesses out there that you might be able to talk the owner into doing a hundred percent owner financing, but yeah. you know, they're not going to be the best businesses. You know, any business owner that's doing well in their business 
is knows the value of their business or no. And that's actually part of what me and you have to deal with every day is not only do they Absolutely. know the value of their business, but a lot of times they think their business is worth more than it actually is. Yes. You know what I mean? So it's the opposite problem. You know, there's not too many business. I, there's not too many business owners out there going, yeah, I'm making tons of money and, and I got to exit this business. And, um, you know, there's no way a buyer's just going to pay money for it. You know, I'm going to have to do some owner financing, and you know, they yeah. can come in. It, it's just, I don't know. I'm and, and if it is, that. if you do find, yeah, me too. We we get a lot of that. If there is a completely pa what is passive income, right? If there is a business that's throwing off a ton of EBITDA and the owners are absentee, chances are that's unsustainable, and they just got it. They just got it there through a ton of hard work, and they installed some management, and it's doing it right now. But that doesn't mean if you slide in, the manager is going to stay and it's going to keep making money. It's probably a temporary thing if, if, if it's operating to make money without ownership. And that's what small business is, is it's managing a business through the best use of the assets and the, and the resources that it has. And that's almost impossible to do in an absentee format. So, you know, in the beginning of the show, Neil, I, I made a comment. And I said, if you stay with the show long enough, you'll find out what an M&M, &M, what M&Ms and uh, business brokerage have to do with each other. So I wanted to touch on that real quick. Um, sure. Neil, I got to tell you, you know, like what I love about our industry is that, you know, especially when we go to conferences and me and you talk, you know, quite a bit, you know, we share information with each other, what works, what doesn't work. And you told me something a couple of years ago and I was like, I like the idea of it, but the question, I was like, that's a stupid question though. I'm going to think of another question, but before I say why I ended up you at using the same question that you use, I actually see use the same question. Can you explain to the audience about the M and M situation? Sure. Sure. And, um, so I think the origination is, is Van Halen or some other eighties rock band. And they had this blue M and M rider on their contract. And the idea was, we come to town, we got a ton of things that we want to see done and we want everything done and a very, very long list. And at the, like the end of the list, they'd say no, no blue M&Ms. And it would be like, why, why is that so specific? And the reason was they could show up and get to their green room. And if they saw a bowl of M&Ms and there were blue ones in there, they knew that the people reading the contract, they didn't pay attention. They're, they didn't follow all the instructions and get all the details right. And something was off. So that was like their litmus test. So I use that in business brokerage. When we, as you know, Jim, we take a business owner's business to market and we spend hours, hours of time and resources. We outsource and we do all this stuff. We put together multiple this, hours. You're talking about prepping, right? Well, yeah. Prepping. We build the book, the SIM, the CBR. And we're proud of that. Like we, we spend all this time and we know business owners are going to ask all these questions questions and we got all the questions answered in the book most of them right and we've even done an interview with the owner that's we spent 30 40 minutes trying to get the other questions that the i've learned i think you've learned that they can read the book but they want to hear it from the owner so right. the strategy is towards the end of the interview with the owner as you wait, ask wait wait wait, wait let me explain because a lot of business brokers don't know might not know what you're talking okay. about so um what Neil and I do and some other business brokers do is, you know, you write up the SIM, the confidential information memorandum, and you can, you can write everything, you know, write about the business and tell about the business. And you can talk to a buyer over the phone and you yeah. can answer their questions. But at the end of the day, even if they read it, even if you tell them over the phone, they still want to know those questions directly from the seller. And so when we get on a buyer seller phone call, the, the buyer will ask the same questions that we read that they read about and that we have told them because they want to hear it directly from the seller. Well, in order to reduce the amount of time that the that those buyer and seller calls take place or to make it so the buyers ask more in-depth questions, me and Neil and some other people around the country, we record a video call with the business owner asking the most common questions that buyers are going to ask no matter whether they know the answer or not. And we include it in the SIM, a link in the SIM. Yeah. And it's a video that the general public can't see. It's on a Correct. private link. And, um, you know, and then they can hear the questions direct from the seller. And again, the strategy of that is, is that way the buyer 
you know, you, they, they can hear it directly from the seller and hopefully the buyer seller phone call when we move to that stage is shorter, which we're saving the seller's time or the buyer's asking more in depth questions, which will speed up the process to getting to an offer. So go ahead and yeah. pick it up from there, Neil. I apologize. Thank you for setting the stage. And if you if you're not doing the buyer owner interview, it, it's a game changer because you can write in your SAM or your book. Reason for sale is retirement. But until the owner, the buyer asks the owner that question, and the owner says, I am retiring. They'll never believe it. They want to hear it from the owner. But the owner gets tired of saying that and spending the time. Over so this, and over again. Over and over again. Buyer seller calls. It goes, it goes to deal fatigue. So you have the book on paper and you have the interview with the owner. But how do you make sure they watch the interview with the owner? The, the buyer at this stage of the deal is asking for the owner's time, which is extremely valuable. So that's where this blue m m test comes in. I know I've planted a question at the very end of the 30, 40 minute interview with the owner. It could be the m m test. It could be something like, hey, where's your favorite place of vacation? But it's something that they have to watch the entire thing to get to that. If I ask, the, if the buyer says, I want to meet with the owner and I say, where's your play, favorite place of vacation? They say, I don't know. How would I know that? Then I say, you're asking to meet with the owner and you didn't take the 30 to 40 minutes that we've given you to review the, the interview that they made. I don't think you're ready to meet with the owner yet. So do you ask what their favorite color M&M is? I've, I ask them a series. It could be the M and M. It could be a vacation. The M and M question is kind of funny, but I've asked I'm them other I actually asked them because you you gave me this idea, Neil. And when you first told me this, I was like, you actually asked the seller. Maybe you've changed since then. I go, you actually I have. asked the seller what their favorite color M and M is, and you go, yes. And I'm like, okay, I like the idea of making them have to answer the question so we know what they watch the video. But I go, that's a yeah. really stupid question. <laughs> well, the first time I asked a seller that, I didn't tell them I was going to ask them that question. Yeah. And I asked them that. I said, and I would say, this next question, the seller has no idea what this is, and it's going to seem really odd to them that I'm asking this question. Yeah. But it's I want to, I'm asking this so that we know that you're you've been watching the video. And then I <laughs> asked the question, and and the first one I did, the seller was like. He, the look on his face, I was like, this is priceless. So I do it. On, I, that's the question that's I ask great. on all, all of them without them knowing that I'm going <laughs> to ask that question. Literally. I love the look on their face and it just the, the, real, the realism or seeing them as a real person being taken back. Like, why are you asking my favorite color, my M&M? Uh, that's funny it. that you did. No, I, I have done the M&M question. I've done the vacation question. I, the main thing is I want to make sure that buyer has committed yeah. all of that time. But that's hilarious that you asked that same question every time. I asked that same question. I love that's it. I great. think it was a great idea that you had, Neil. I love it. I love it. And that's what I love about our industry. And me and you yeah. share information with each other and other brokers share information. But I'm going to ask you, the, I want to ask you this question because it's really important. I want to okay. make sure, I want to see how many people are actually watching the video to this, to this length in time. So I want to ask you, Neil, what is your favorite color m and M? I knew you were going to ask me that. I'm going to go with the blue. It's the blue, the blue? M&M. But the blue M&M, because of the rider and the Van Halen contract, that's the one oh, I'm looking for. Okay, great. And I'll, I'm going to stick with blue too. So if you're watching this, I would love it if you put in the comment section, on the comment section, something about blue M&Ms and, and make it so that if somebody's not watching the video, they're like, why is everybody talking about blue M&Ms? So let's make a big conversation about blue M&Ms in the, in, in the uh, comment section, if you don't mind. <laughs> All right, Neil, we don't have much more time. I just want to ask you real quick. Yeah. I want to get your take because you have done so much for our industry, you know, between the Carolina Virginia Business Brokers Association, the IBBA, you've done a lot for them. You're, you've been on a lot of committees. You're on a really important yeah. committee right now called Steps to Success Committee, which is bringing in new business brokers and getting them up to speed. Why? I give back a lot to the industry too, but I want the audience to hear from you why you do so much for the industry because you're taking out a lot of your personal time and the time you could be working to make more money for your company and your family and you're devoting it to the industry. Why? Well, I appreciate that question, Jim. And, and it is an interesting question. Why would I go to a conference and give my secrets away to other business intermediaries I'm competing with. There's only so many business brokers. We all are looking at listings. And why would I share my famous blue M&M <laughs> secret 
uh, on an international broadcast, the Let's Chat show. And and why would I give my time to the CVBBA and to the IBBA? And the, the answer is I have an abundance mindset, right? There's a, a, a scarcity mindset and an abundance mindset. And I think that there's not just so many pieces of the pie. The pie just keeps getting bigger. And I'm not afraid to share what, what I know, what's worked for me, because if I do that, other people are going to share with me. The business brokered community specifically is a very giving it is. industry. Everybody wants to help each other. And, and when you serve your local boards, the international board, when you give to others, it always comes back and you end up networking with, you get to rub shoulders with some of the greats in the industry. And that's, that's what you get yeah. back. You might not get it back immediately, but I could call some of the, the best intermediaries in the country and they'll take my call and they'll, I can give them very specific granular challenges that I'm having and they will give me their answer. They will make time for me because they see that I care about this industry, that I've served others. It all comes back around. We're all just going to sharpen each other's saws and, and, it, and there's enough out there for everyone. So that's why I serve on the boards. I, I'm a huge proponent of the IBBA. I think that any business intermediary can get involved in that association and learn so much and network with some of the great business brokers. We're all aligned and becoming better business brokers. That's why I give my time. And I think that's why I've been successful in this field is because, you know, you, you give and you get. That's what life's about. You know, the more you, 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 the more you do for others, it, it somehow it comes back. But I know that's not the reason that you're doing it at the end of the day. It's because you, you care and we're elevating the industry in its entirety. And I might tell you, the industry is, I don't know, it's completely different than it was 25 years ago when I first got into the industry. I mean, it's just grown up and matured so much. And we're just keep getting our, our industry keeps getting better and better. And I think that's fantastic. I love our industry. We're so I blessed to live in a time with a great market and with a great time to do business deals and to have the resources that we have available through through our associations. And I mean, there's just so much to, to learn and so much to give. It's a really exciting time. I really appreciate the opportunity to share this time with you, Jim, and with your audience. It's been a lot of fun. Neil, thank you for being on the show and thank you for everything you do for the industry. And before I close out for you viewers out there, you know, we were talking about marketing earlier and uh, we we're talking about different methods of marketing. There's not one thing you didn't pick up that we were talking about earlier in the, in the call was that me and Neil were talking about, like, we love to circle back around to our sellers, love to circle back around to our buyers and just to say, hi, and how are you doing? What's going on? And, and I'm sure I'm going to speak for Neil. Um, but I know for myself, you know, that leads to a ton of referrals. And as you are more ingrained in the industry, that goes a long way. Most of your business is going to be coming from referrals and that's yeah. how you keep those referrals up. So I just wanted to point that out in case you didn't put those, that two and two together, but you know, business brokers out there or anybody else that's watching, thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it until next time. Take care.